Thank you very much, Fred. It's an honour and a pleasure to be here, and thank you to everyone for making time available in their busy schedules. I'd like to talk about um, the global outlook, as has been mentioned, and in particular the implications for us in the West. Um, in my view, the recent financial crisis should be seen in a much broader context. I think it should be seen in terms of a shift in the balance of power from the West to the East. It's a shift that, in my view, is still very much in the early stages, and it's a shift that takes a long time, decades and many, many years, not weeks and months. And in terms of this shift, I think it's clearly a shift in economic and financial power. It's not a shift in military power. And even though we've moved from G8 to G20, it's not yet clear yet it's a shift in political power, although it may well become that. In this shift, I think the winners will fall into one of three categories in terms of nations. First, it will be countries that have the financial resources, such as China or Qatar, say. Second, it will be the countries that have the natural or other resources that I would define as water, food, energy. And water is particularly important. And the winners in that environment will come from a variety of regions around the world. Indeed, when the food crisis hit in the summer of 08, it highlighted that many countries rich in natural resources, particularly in Africa, had previously not received the inward investment they needed to develop those resources. If they do, then I think some of the winners will be in Africa. I think the winners will also be in the Middle East, Brazil, and naturally Russia. And third and finally, in addition to the winners having the financial resources and the natural resources, the winners will be those countries that have the ability to adapt and change. In my view, the US clearly, after this near-term shock, will have the ability to adapt and change. And contrary to what everyone else says, I also believe the UK will have the ability to adapt and change. If I'm correct about this longer-term trend, I believe that we are in for a super growth cycle for the world economy, where in coming years we will look back on this period as a very painful one, but as one of adjustment in this longer-term, very positive upward trend. Today I'd like, within that context, to focus on three areas. First, the current cycle and how it's impacting emerging economies. Second, some of the longer-term shifts, touching also on India and China. And third and finally, the implications for the West. In terms of the current cycle, I would say the outcome of this crisis, like all previous crises, depends on the same three key factors that always determine the final outcome. The economic fundamentals, the policy response, and confidence. I think the fundamentals improve the further east one goes. Confidence is always the hardest to call, but I think the policy response has been phenomenally positive. Two years ago, I would say the world economy was on the ceiling, if we use this rumour as an analogy. Back in March, it was on the floor, and now we're up to the level of the table. And that's because of the policy response. When America unveiled its tax cuts last year, it was said at the time the tax cuts needed to achieve the three Ts, being timely, targeted, and temporary. If I use that an analogy for the global policy boost, I would use the three S's. The policy boost has been synchronized, sizable, and successful. Fiscal policy, in particular, does work. However, one thing I think is very important in using the analogy of going from the floor, ceiling to the floor, back up to the table, is that people don't talk enough about levels. And when we look at levels, the world economy is about $61 trillion. A decade ago, it was about 30 odd trillion. So it's been a boom time for the world economy. Within that 61 trillion, roughly speaking, America's about four and a half, 14 and a half trillion. Japan's about 4.9 trillion. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through every country. But China is about 4.4 trillion. Germany is about 3.7. Britain is about 2.7. And then if you go down, you've got Russia probably around 1.7, Brazil 1.6. If you club all the Southeast Asian countries together, they will be about 1.5 trillion. If you club the Gulf countries together, they'll probably be about 1.1 trillion. And India is 1.2 trillion. The gist of it is that the emerging economies can't boom if the West is not booming. And I don't think in the near term the West is going to boom. And that is probably the big challenge, the dependency still of many countries on the West. And we saw this when the post Lehman's crisis really hit last autumn. Then many countries that had not engaged in excesses seen in the West 
were hit very hard. Uh, at the beginning of this year, the European Central Bank talked about how global trade normally takes two years to recover to a pre-recession level. And at that time, it was saying it was very similar to the early 80s when it took four years for global trade to get back to its pre-recession level. But post Lehman's, it was not only the hit in demand, it was also the fact that many countries had built up high levels of inventories because they expected both demand to remain high and over a year ago they expected commodity prices to keep on rising. But also particularly last autumn, we saw um, a collapse in trade finance and in insurance. Um, China and India, roughly a quarter of their exports and imports depended on letters of credit, in fact slightly more. And we worked with governments in both countries to sort of help unblock some of these issues. So there was a financial hit, but it highlighted the sort of impact in terms of the West. And that's the big challenge. Emerging economies need to drive more of their own growth. And this is a particular challenge. It means altering their growth model, and it takes time. At the end of last year, and that started this year in response to the crisis, in the West, here in the States, but also in the UK, there was emphasis put on the fact that the savers were partly or primarily responsible for the crisis. Wen Jibao, the Chinese Premier, speaking in Davos, rebutted this quite aggressively. And in his response, he said, why is it that in the West, people only talk about Adam Smith's invisible hand? Why do they never, ever mention Adam Smith's visible hand, mentioned in the theory of moral sentiments? And as Wen Jibao said, Smith's visible hand was about morals and ethics. And he basically said, you can't blame China and the savers. And I think in some respects that is true, but it does highlight that the 1944 Bretton Woods Agreement that set the post-war agenda needs to change. That agenda was putting all the, or put all the emphasis on the borrowers to get their act together. Keynes wanted it to focus on the savers as well. And really in the post-war analysis, the likes of China, not just China now, but before that, Japan and Germany maybe could have come more up to the plate would be the point I would make. But certainly, when one looks at the crisis, I do think there was a partial role that the savers played. The crisis reflected both a systemic failure in the financial system and the imbalanced global economy. And if we look at the systemic failure in the financial system, I'm not going to go into detail on it here, but there was a lack of risk management, a lack of liquidity management, but also in particular the pro-cyclicality, which I call the three Gs, Glass-Steagall, Greenspan and Greed. The Getting rid of the Glass-Steagall Act did remove the distinction, as we've mentioned, or many people mentioned, between commercial and investment banks. But then we had the Greenspan effect, which is where China came in. China exported deflation to such an extent at the time we wrote that Ch CPI figures, consumer price indices, should have been renamed China price indices. In response, central bankers in the West kept interest rates far too low, and then we had the collective greed. It wasn't just in the financial industry, but investors, savers, everyone wanted higher yields, and that led to the problems. So in that respect, there was an impact of the savers. By moving global savings from the east to the west, they kept short and longer-term interest rates lower than they needed to have been. But maybe people look more at the imbalanced global economy. And there you can say, yes, maybe the savers did basically play a part, but again, correcting this takes time. At this year's annual Asian Development Bank meeting, back in May, President Kuroda of the ADB talked about the need for Asia to help rebalance its economy in order to help rebalance the global economy. And he highlighted three areas in particular that Asian economies needed to focus on. One was the need to have better social safety nets, given the high level of personal savings across many Asian countries basically to reduce the need for precautionary savings. Second was the need to help SMEs, small, medium-sized enterprises. And third and very importantly was the need to actually deepen and broaden Asia's bond markets. Asia's bond markets had tripled in size in the last decade, but they're still relatively small compared to, say, the US bond market. In fact, emerging East Asia, the total bond market is $3.94 trillion. And that's roughly split 72% government, 28% corporate. But within that, China is about 2.2 trillion, and there it's 85% government and only 15% the corporate bond market. What was interesting, though, being in that session where it was the governor session of the ADB, so all the senior policymakers from the region were there in front of President Kuroda, what was interesting was that that time, 
there was not open agreement on what President Kuroda had proposed. In fact, of the three things, safety nets, help to SMEs, and deepening and broadening the bond market, there was only collective agreement about the need for the first, to basically have a bigger and better social safety net. There was little enthusiasm, it struck me at that time, on the need to deepen and broaden Asia's bond markets. But in actual fact, that's what we need to see. In fact, I would go even further. We need to see deeper and broader capital markets across Asia and indeed across other regions. Because it's not just household savings that are high. Particularly in China, it's corporate savings that are particularly high. But when you've just had a financial crisis in the West and when the likes of India feel that they've done well out of this crisis by not deepening their markets, you can see the resistance we need to come up against. And therefore, I think that in terms of the shift in the balance of power and the shift to a more balanced global economy, it takes time. But the important thing is that the debate has begun. And that leads on to the final part of this first section, which is this crisis has also highlighted issues about the overall policy stance now, particularly across Asia. Ahead of this crisis, two or three years ago, if we had stood here or sat here, one of the issues was whether policy tools and institutions across the emerging world were up to it. Would they be able to withstand a likely shock? I would say with the exception of Eastern Europe, or Central and Eastern Europe, where I think there were problems, I would say that across many regions of the world, the answer is that policy institutions and in turn policy tools were up to the crisis, certainly in Brazil, but across other regions as well. Fiscal policy has, has highlighted this. Um, I would call American and British fiscal policies the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that we did something. The bad is we didn't do it from a position of strength, having had surpluses in the good time. And the ugly is the consequences more in terms of future taxation. Many emerging economies had built up their surpluses, so they were in the position of strength. But one of the interesting things at the moment is that whereas here in the States and also in Britain, a lot of the debate is about the level of debt, particularly government debt. When you go to the emerging economies, it's about not the quantity, but the quality of the debt, i.e., where is the spending? In Korea, for instance, a lot of the huge fiscal boosts, they were at the top of the OECD scales in terms of the fiscal stimulus. A lot of it went on infrastructure, a lot of it went on tax cuts. But if you go to Korea, they believe that they're positioning the country very well in terms of the future, in terms of fusion and green technology. And they probably spent more of their fiscal boost on that area than any other country. You go to China, likewise, I was there a month ago, they were talking very much about where they're spending their money. Now, admittedly, bank loans and that side of the equation has taken precedent recently, but the, today the National Development Reform Commission has announced 20 new industry funds to be set up in China, seeded by the government, but the hope is that the private sector and bank lending comes in and takes off. And then we were just talking at the table before lunch about Singapore. In Singapore, you talk to the policymakers there. Behind the scenes, they talk about Singapore wants to develop a general-purpose technology. These are once-in-a-lifetime technologies, such as x-rays maybe or telephones, that can transform not only an economy, but create wealth. The interesting thing is whether they achieve it or not is not the issue. They're part of the process across East Asia where people are talking proactively about the role government can play, and they're creating a very enabling environment. Their response to the argument that the West always comes up with the ideas is that value creation may take place in the West. Value appropriation is going to take place here in Asia. We will basically monopolize the supply chain. Interest rate policy as well has done well, but that's probably where the biggest dilemma is at this stage of this cycle across Asia in particular. They're damned if they do, and they're damned if they don't. By tying effectively to a US interest rate policy, they're getting themselves in the same problems that m the Middle East got itself into a few years ago, particularly in Dubai, one might say. Um, at the moment, well, it depends on which country you're looking at, but those countries that raise rates may start to attract hot money inflows, which causes problems. The worry, of course, is if that they do not raise interest rates, then it starts to feed asset price bubbles. And when you speak to policymakers, particularly across Asia, one of the underlying themes, more so in China than anywhere else in my view, is can an export oriented country raise its interest rates before America? What we're seeing is that Israel has, Australia has, we think India will soon, 
Indonesia will soon, and South Korea is thinking twice, but probably will hike early part of next year. China, we're not sure about. We think as much for geopolitical reasons as anything else, they will hold off. That concludes the first part of where we are in the cycle. The second part, I'd like to highlight some of the underlying longer-term themes. And I'll touch first on Asia, but draw it out more generally to emerging economies. The first issue I think that needs to be addressed is how we define Asia. It might seem strange, um, but I think it's important for understanding the thinking across the region. I tend to think in Asian terms of South Asia, East Asian exporters, East Asian domestic demand. South Asia is often overlooked. In fact, across East Asia, many people don't think of South Asia as part of Asia. But India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, there are big challenges in Pakistan. Um, we're a big foreign bank in Pakistan. I do visit Pakistan. I probably don't want to say too much on the record about Pakistan, but there are challenges. But India is phenomenally positive, in my view. India has the ability to transform South Asia, the Middle East, and East Africa in the same way in which China has transformed East Asia. But India has lots of challenges. In fact, India is very much a tale of two different nations. You have a very developed Western and Central, Western and Southern part, export orientated, well educated, but the rural hinterland suffers from a lack of infrastructure, a lack of education, and maybe over-regulation. India, though, unlike China, has a young population. 600 million people are below 25. In our view, that India needs to generate the jobs, and it can only do that not by moving into services, but mo by moving into wholesale manufacturing. In fact, we, in our longer-term view, see a distinct process where global manufacturing moves from China to India, and then eventually to Africa, where the resources are more plentiful. Admittedly, we're talking a 30 to 40 year process on that. But South Asia, do not overlook South Asia. It's one fifth of the world's population, and in terms of global trade, the most underdeveloped region of the world. East Asian exporters versus East Asian domestic demand. East Asian exporters, take Hong Kong, exports and imports 350% of GDP. Singapore, exports and imports 360% of GDP. Taiwan exports and imports 127% of GDP. Is it any surprise that when the West has a recession, these countries are hit hard? But I think rather than just looking at it in these terms of exports versus domestically driven, and the domestically driven economies are in addition to India, Indonesia, and China, I tend to also think it's important to look at Asia in industrial structural terms. And when one does that, it mirrors income per head quite clearly across the region. And I think this is important because when one looks to develop an economy from a policy standpoint, the desire is to improve the standard of living of the population. And also across Asia, it's very clearly to emulate those seen as higher up the scale than you currently are. At the top is Japan. In many respects, hard to define. It has not had a good crisis. I call it a hybrid economy. The service sector is, the develop, is developed, but only serves the domestic economy. Manufacturing is at the frontier end, but it's very, whilst it's high quality, it's very narrowly focused. But certainly Japan is the country that the likes of South Korea and Taiwan aspire to. Below Japan, in terms of income per head, you then have Hong Kong and Singapore. service oriented high GDP per head. They're very developed in terms of their financial and business services. Hong Kong, virtually no manufacturing. Singapore, the manufacturing is very much at the value added area. Then we come to South Korea and Taiwan. South Korea has had a very good crisis. Advanced capital intensive industries, they've invested heavily in R&D, in product innovation, and very importantly, in brand awareness. Their two countries, or economies, I probably should use the word mentioning Taiwan, um, who will probably be able to withstand the emergence of China, even though SMEs have moved heavily to the mainland. Then we have next down is Malaysia and Thailand, who I think are challenged. They have mixed manufacturing, but very much commoditized sectors that could be gobbled up by China. And then you move down to the catch-up economies, labor-intensive manufacturing companies and economies, China, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, India, and Pakistan. They're all moving up in labor intensity, and they're moving from being cheap, low quality to remaining cheap and becoming higher quality. 
but again, it takes time. And within this, we have a number of small niche players, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, who are at the cutting edge. But as I say, everyone is trying to emulate. And I think this is quite important because when one looks at this, we're seeing some big underlying global trends already emerging. New trade corridors are being seen. Intra-Asian trade is rising sharply with China at the center. Asian-African trade, Asian-Middle Eastern trade, Asian-Latin American trade. When I was in Brazil last year, before the crisis, the phrase used when I spoke to the policymakers was, it doesn't matter if America has a recession, if China has a recession, that matters. And they're right. Obviously, America's recession does matter, but China's recession will probably matter more for Brazil. Hu Jintao, when he visited uh, the region a few years ago, had aspirations for trade growth. They've exceeded that already. In fact, I haven't checked the data recently, but roughly speaking, China LATAM trade is about a third, I think, of China US trade. It's pretty big. You go across Africa. We are very positive about Africa longer term, but China is developing its strategy with Africa big time, is buying up resources on a large scale. So new trade corridors are very evident. Another underlying longer term trend is demographics. Now, admittedly, demographics is not destiny. China and India for the last 150 years didn't perform as their economies should have done given their population. China's population does age rapidly after the next 12 years, hence the previously often quoted phrase that China will be old before it's rich. But it's investing in its people as well as developing its infrastructure. India, as I mentioned earlier, is very young. In fact, if you take a trend to 2050, what's positive for America is that America, alongside India, is one of those countries where the population keeps growing over that period. Demographics is an opportunity if it leads on to the job creation and the emergence of a middle class. The Asian Development Bank calculates that Asia alone needs to generate 750 million jobs over the next decade. Phenomenal. The bulk of those, admittedly, are in India and China, but they're also in Indonesia and in Vietnam. If those jobs are generated, then the emerging middle class becomes very evident. And we see this as a bank in the region. The emerging middle class is already evident, and people do save. And it's a good market for the Western companies to sell into. But it's not just Asia. The Middle East as well. The demographics there are very interesting. We call it the three Ds when we look at the Middle East. Demographics, diversification, and the dollar. The Middle East is always going to be dependent on energy or driven by energy. That's not going to change. But they need, given their young populations, to diversify, to diversify into non-energy areas to generate the jobs. And as they do that, in our view, they will need to change their dollar policy to gear a policy more suited to their likely economic development. And I'll come to this later. The Middle East leads on to another longer-term theme already evident, which is the infrastructure boom. This is apparent everywhere. It does, al does always lead to the possibility and indeed likelihood that we will see infrastructure investment in areas that are not as productive as they should be. But that's the nature of the game. And it leads on to the final longer-term theme I'd like to mention, which is the role of the state. I've written about this before. State capitalism, I think, is very evident in terms of how certainly the East views the world, and maybe it will be a legacy of how we in the West view the world. Bob Kimmett, number two at the Treasury, I think at the time, wrote a good piece a year ago about the four sovereigns. Sovereign wealth funds, state-owned enterprises, government pension funds, foreign exchange reserves. Sovereign wealth funds were centre of attention 18 months ago. In fact, I testified to the Senate Banking Committee and Congressional Foreign Affairs Committee on this. What's interesting is that they're still centre of attention in some people's eyes, but the other parts of government intervention have taken a bigger role. China with state-owned enterprises, well-resourced, so much so that I tend to say to people, the three words you've seen the most in the last decade were made in China. The three words you'll see the most in the next decade will be owned by China. And the other is foreign exchange reserves. Back in March, February, I think it was this year, the IMF had a session with reserves managers. And this, I wasn't 
there, but the feedback I got afterwards was that the feeling was that these countries who were there would all build up their foreign exchange reserves following this crisis. And that's certainly the message I get going around the world talking to policymakers. They view Asia as having protected itself by building up currency reserves, and I think more countries will build up their currency reserves in the future. So <clears throat> I think the role of the state becomes particularly important. It might well be a positive, but one, I'll leave you with one worrying aspect, is when the food crisis was at its peak last summer, one should not underestimate the number of countries who were talking at that time about the need to reduce the role of the market in the determinant of key prices, such as food prices. The feeling was, why is it that speculators should be there driving food prices higher? And should we not basically have a barter type of economy where governments sell food to other countries? Didn't materialise, but that's the sort of issue that comes back to the head, to the agenda, when we start to see speculators moving into these markets. Finally, in this section, just to finish with China. Um, look, actually, there's so much to say on China. Um, when I testified to well, the UK a couple of years ago, because I, I was speaking to politicians, I used the phrase that China was a Robin Hood, Goldilocks, and Superman economy, um, just to highlight the problems. It was Robin Hood because it was taken from the West and given to the poor. And if you go around the rest of the world outside of the West, the view of China has changed phenomenally, from being seen as a competitive threat to now being seen as a market to sell into. That helps China not only economically but politically. The Goldilocks was basically they need to keep the temperature just right. Too cold, unemployment goes up. Too hot, inflation picks up. And that's a big, big challenge. And then the Superman economy is up, up and away, but Superman's kryptonite problem China's kryptonite problem is lack of resources. Therefore, the trend is up, but people underestimate the longer-term potential. At the moment, the big challenge is the one I touched on earlier in terms of interest rate policy and keeping inflation in check. But I think the balance of the economy is such that people often overlook the fact that Chinese consumer spending growth is very strong. It's just that investment growth is so much stronger as a percent of GDP consumption seems low. But household consumption has been 10.9% year on year over the last decade. But currency policy, in my view, is the big challenge as well. And I think there's no doubt that China needs to have a stronger currency. Yet, gradualism dictates what they do, and I don't see any easy early solution to this problem. Third and finally, what does all this mean for the West? I've just got a handful of global implications. Globalization and protectionism is the first. The challenge is that countries talk global, talk regional, and act national. The G20 this year was a fantastic success. It replicated the success seen between the Plaza and the Louvre Accord. It was a success because it was in everyone's best interests to do so. I think it's very important that countries in the West need to continue to embrace openness and set the example. In the UK, for instance, I'm not an expert on the US checks and balances, but to give you an idea of the UK, there are people who are a bit more protectionist maybe than you might imagine in the UK. But the UK, we have three checks and balances in place. We have first, well, the context is we called it the Wimbledon effect in Britain. The idea is that Britain has the best tennis tournament but never wins it, but at least it takes place in London. And the argument used in the city was ownership doesn't matter as long as it's here. So it doesn't matter if it's owned by domestic or owned by foreigners as long as the business is done in London. But given that you need to have checks and balances, and we have three, the first is independent competition authorities can block anything on competition grounds. The second is independent regulatory authorities can block anything on regulatory grounds. And then the government has the Enterprise Act, which protects sensitive areas. There's only two areas defined as sensitive. One naturally is defence, the other is media. I've argued that we should have energy and energy type issues in there as well. But I think it's important that the West, in particularly America, embraces openness, but that you, if you get worried about protectionism, I would argue we need to go down the route of better checks and balances in place. Second is cost versus quality. Globalisation ultimately means that someone working in Shanghai is going to get paid the same as someone working in Seattle, or someone working in Detroit will get placed, 
the same as someone working in Delhi. That's painful adjustment. America and Britain can either compete on cost or quality. Hopefully we can compete on both, but if you say to the electorate we're going to compete on cost, they won't believe you. We need to move up the value curve, and the positives are that still many countries in the West score highly on R&D, Finland in particular, infrastructure needs to be developed, and patents as well. But as I mentioned earlier, whilst the perception is that the West innovates and Asia copies, value appropriation is seen as a big issue in Asia. Environment, green revolution. Look, we could spend all day talking about the environment. Normally these issues have one of three outcomes, a price solution, a quantity solution, or a technology solution. Maybe it will be all three. But the most frightening figure I heard recently was that in China, 3% of families have cars. I think in America you have over 100%, but I think in terms of households it's something like 60% have cars. You can argue about the US data, but let's not get too bogged down in that. But if China goes from 3% to 4% by 2012-13, that's 10,000 cars per day, just to go from 3% to 4%. That highlights the environmental challenge. And finally, or maybe oh, two finals, one is the dollar and the other is geopolitics. Where's the dollar going? Um, the Chinese have tried to undermine the dollar by the back door. They've questioned it both as a store of value and as a medium of exchange. The issue, though, is where are the alternatives? This year, the Chinese have certainly, in, at the same time as questioning the dollar, have tried to both improve the lot of the Chinese currency as a medium of exchange, and most people would also think, in terms of a store of value, the Chinese currency has a lot going for it. But this year, the Chinese have enacted bilateral swap deals with South Korea, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Indonesia, Belarus, and Argentina. Chinese currency trade settlement started in July between Hong Kong and the mainland, um, Shanghai and four other cities in Guangdong. More Chinese bond issuance is set to take place in Hong Kong, which is likely to become the offshore CMY center on a big scale. When the Chinese premier met the Brazilian premier earlier this year, they agreed to start paying each other in their own currencies, not in the dollar. So it's a backdoor undermining of the dollar at the same time that CMY becomes more important in terms of trade. But the question is, what's the alternative? And the worry, of course, is that if we see the dollar continue to weaken, then the shock absorber becomes the tradable currencies like the euro, which leads to big problems for the weaker European countries like Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece and Spain, which are already uncompetitive with the euro at current levels. In terms of central banks moving more and more into increased reserves, the question is what do they put their money in? We call it passive diversification, not active diversification. With the exception maybe of Brazil, not many central banks seem to have actively sold the dollar. What's happening is that more and more countries are putting less of their net new reserves in dollars. We calculate it in the last six months that about 40% of net new reserves has gone in dollars, whereas before it would probably be 60 to 65%. Um, basically, it's not in anyone's best interest to actively sell the dollar, lest it causes the crisis they fear, but we're seeing less and less of the net new reserves go into dollars. In time, our underlying view is that more countries will start to trade their currency or manage their cur currency against the countries with which they trade. In the Middle East, the Christmas before last, a senior policymaker there said to me, what the West doesn't realize is that it's forcing us to sit in the same boat as people like Russia and China. And as he said to me, when you sit in the same boat as these people, first you talk and then you become friends. And I think we're starting to see shifts in thinking about currency policy, if not yet actions on the big scale in terms of shifts, in terms of tying to the dollar. And the final point is the political aspect. The geopolitical world is changing. Good economics is good politics. And if you take a view as I do about where the shifts are going, that implies economic shifts and political shifts. Gas and oil is particularly important. Russia is particularly important within this. In terms of gas, it's Nigeria, Iran, Qatar, and Russia. China is buying up stakes in Nigerian energy fields. 
and it's trying to buy up a stake in one of the Ghanaian fields as well. G8 has become G20. My own view is that the Chinese aren't really bothered as to whether it's G20 or not. They certainly didn't like it to be G8, but no one's quite sure yet about whether G20 is the final, the best outcome. But what I would say is that with Korea now chairing G20 next year, there's an opportunity for the players who are not in G8 but are in G20 to be more proactive. Up to now, they've taken a very passive role. But my own view is that the Chinese do not want anything that changes UN permanent member status. And this, in my view, if I brought it back to a British angle, is where Britain needs to start thinking slightly differently. And instead of being a sort of supplicant to America, agreeing with America on all policies, we need to start thinking differently about some of these issues. Because Britain's permanent member status, I think, is safe as long as Russia and China don't want to debate the issue. But certainly there is a geopolitical shift that underlies all this economic shift. And my view is, like yours, it's very difficult to predict on this, but I may be best to stick to the economics. But certainly the G2, not talked about, when President Obama changed it from a strategic economic to a strategic and economic dialogue, I thought that word and was probably the most important word this year, because it does put America in, on the front foot, both on strategic and economic discussions with China. So in conclusion, I think that we should look, in terms of what's happening globally, as a shift in the balance of power. The shift will be a slow one. The winners will be those with the financial resources. The winners will be those with natural resources. The winners will be those that have the ability to adapt and change. Sitting here in America and in Britain, people tend to maybe be a bit more pessimistic than they previously were at this stage of any cycle. But I think both America and Britain clearly have the ability to adapt and change. But if we're to realise that potential, then we need to be thinking very global in our outlook, talking global, acting global, and forcing through the change. And if that happens, then I think that we will look back on this period as a painful one, but in the context of what I think will eventually be seen as a super growth cycle for the global economy. Thank you for your time.